Hello, breakfast detective. Hello. Hey, how are you? How do I sound? Ooh, ooh, good. A little loud. Hold on. Let me adjust you. Let me adjust you. Here we go. All right. Uh, can you give me a quick All test, right. test, test? Yeah. How is this? Uh, that's fine. There we go. Just that a little bit. Um, did you want to be on cam or like what? Um, I'm going non-cam today just because okay. I'm that's in the fine. middle of doing my makeup. So it's that's I'm, fine. I'm multitasking. All right. Let me just get the guest text up here. All right. We're going to talk to Breakfast Detective. Steven Mama, I miss you. Well, I'm sorry that I've been away for so long. I've been here all along, but uh, I missed speaking with you as well. Um, no, you've been doing you've been doing good good stuff, and it's okay. Like you know, some of us are are smaller fries. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just been a grind. You know, that's that's been the thing. I've had some good luck, and I've had some good content, and it's all worked out pretty well. By the way, uh, what what pronouns do you use? Um, they he. Okay, alrighty. So let me get your little guest text up here. Uh, did you want me to Thank link you. any like social media or anything? Uh, sure. I mean, if 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 people like listen to me and they like some of my takes and they want to see some commie shit posts, they can follow me on Twitter at QT Breakfast. Um, Twitch is a little up in the air. I'm in the process of pivoting towards more video essay content. So if you tune into me on Twitter, you'll get updates about all that. Stuff. All right. So Twitter is where to go. Yeah, QT Breakfast. There we go. We got the we got the guest up. All right. Awesome. So we are here tonight to discuss class reductionism. And uh, I was very interested in having this conversation with you because I stand firmly against class reductionism. And I noticed that you do not hold such uh, such positions. And I would, I'm would i interested to hear your position on it. And I hope you're interested to hear mine because I would love to be able to convince you to no longer support class reductionism. Um, but uh, why don't you lay your case first and then I will respond. Does that sound good? That sounds perfect. Let's um, do it. So basically, I'm kind of of the philosophy that your praxis, how you apply theory in your life, uh -huh. um, you know, your political work, your activism, et cetera, should be intersectional of all, especially if you live in the United States, of all the things that you could or should be focusing on. Like we're talking uh, trans and queer liberation. We're talking women's rights. Uh -huh. We're talking um, like Black Lives Matter and like Afro-American liberation. So like these are all like based and good and is in my opinion what people should be focusing on. But when I say class reductionism, I think that when we're talking about intersectionality, uh -huh. what we're talking about is all of these things underpinned by the fact that there is, there is a class underlying many of this, right? And if we are not like uh, business owners, market movers, et cetera, then we all have class solidarity with one another. And the things that I see as primarily challenging, like the capital holders um, interests in so society are not explicitly intersectional interests, but are class uh -huh. in interests. So if we focus the exclusive amount of our theory and activism explicitly in this kind of game of like civil rights whack-a-mole like mm -hmm. they will give us reforms so we'll go back to work but inevitably like what i think we should maybe be focused on in the long term is that the type of like uh like institutionalized patriarchy that we have in many parts of the west and this this exportation of white supremacy comes from a place of capitalism so once capitalism is removed, the impetuses for all of these things kind of fall away. And there's obviously generations of like bigotry and like sexism and racism that need to be unpacked and dealt with. Mm -hmm. But it's the difference between are we trying to like put out a fire or is this fire raging and we're just trying to, you know, uh, like contain it around the edges, right? It's probably maybe the best way I would... I would I would frame that. Okay, so uh, class like I, I just took a couple notes on this. I just want to make sure that that I'm getting this correct. That class, according to you, class is a an undercurrent that runs underneath all other intersectionalities. All people have class solidarity unless they're an owner or a capitalist, 
and that we should focus on class in the long term because people have class solidarity unless they're an, an owner, right? Yeah, the only thing I, I guess, yeah, 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 90%. The only thing I would add to that is that we're talking about the systems of inter like institutionalized patriarchy and <sighs> exportation of white supremacy, that those things are directly caused and fueled by capitalism. So um, as long as there is capitalism, we will never eradicate those systems. So white supremacy and institutionalized patriarchy, patriarchy are caused by capitalism. Okay, right. so that I would disagree with. That particular claim I would disagree with on a factual basis. Do you believe that, that white supremacy um, it did not exist pre-capitalism? Yes. Really? Yeah, yeah. So That's really we talking... fascinating to me because uh, the slave trade began a long time before modern capitalism began. But the slave trade was also not the same type of white supremacy that we see today. Oh, it absolutely was. So, like, a couple counter e examples to that is sure. that then, in particular, mm -hmm. like, I don't know what period we're talking about. Are mm -hmm. we ballparking, let's say, like, 1700s sure. America kind of thing? Yeah, you could say 1700s so, to 1600s. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the like the like peak of of uh, of like British imperialism was in the 1600s, which was like pre-capitalism by any modern standards. Like capitalism, like it was it, perhaps it could be argued as some form of like feudal mercantile mercantile like like baby capitalism maybe, but like the peak of um of the British uh colonization like happened in the 1600s if I'm not mistaken, right? Like this is when they were taking over countries at a wild like at a, at a massive rate like like uh in expanding right. their trade and and enslaving people based on their skin color um mostly and national identity before that to me that seems like that would be pretty solid evidence of a, of a concept of white supremacy or a concept of if nothing else ethnic supremacy had already existed before that and also ethnic absolutely oh but but does that make does that is that distinction really enough to say that like modern white supremacy is it like is only a product of capitalism also not to like run off on a huge thing but institutionalized patriarchy has existed for way like even primitive communal societies had institutionalized um patriarchy so i don't know how so, that applies historically as an as a, a matter of fact so i would i would actually push back on that so when we're when we're talking about hunter-gatherer societies there's a, a, what some people have described as primitive communism uh -huh. um what a lot of what a lot of the data that we have to show says that it is uh, primarily egalitarian and that there was no there was no material impetus for there to be uh, like the same system of patriarchy so to sort of re reply to that really I quickly I doubt that ex extensively I would love to see okay. what evidence you have that um, that like primitive societies were universally egalitarian um, I'm pretty <sighs> sure that like like in fact I and again some of like I don't have a, a like a, a a, a, a tome of historical text here offhand but i yeah, i remember yeah. learning extensively about many many like i mean hell even like um even like early um mesopotamian societies had very explicit um patriar pr patriarchal structures um right even even before they had become kingdoms or or, or anything like that I, I don't think that there's enough right, evidence to right, say right, that right. primitive um like communistic societies were like not patriarchal like i've never seen any evidence so, of that. so so when we're talking about primitive communism right so uh -huh. it's well before mesopotamia it's pre-agrarian revolution so mm. it's pre the dawn of people seeding plants and like collectivizing resources in one area stockpiling for the next winter kind of thing i'm talking about like mesopotamia is thousands of years after that right so what we're talking about is extremely primitive systems that don't have economies that don't have they don't even have a barter economy at at at, at this point right it's small communities of people of like 50 or less mm -hmm. right and in those situations uh there's no material basis for people to be patriarchal many people would collectively well you're saying children, that but is there evidence resources. of that because i i seem to recall yes. that even in even in like like neanderthal like 
pseudo society that there were strictly de delineated gender roles and Spoon. that those roles often meant that the men were the the leaders of of the groups and that they were you know the primary ones who would go out and fight um and therefore mm -hmm. were afforded a, a certain position in society as leaders um so i so I just I just want to I would say, love I think, to know like where that where that evidence like where you have gotten that conclusion because that's not uh, again my my extent of like anthropolo anthropological research is like having done two or three courses in college on this right yeah so the one thing I would say is this is a distinction that like on the face like sounds exactly like what you're talking about but I think this is also the difference between when we're contextualizing these things, right? Like for instance, when you're talking about white supremacy, like mm -hmm. we have to be very specific if we're gonna dismantle these types of things, right? And like the white supremacy that we have today is not the same as the slave trade that was based on like a bunch of different factors a couple hundred years ago. Like they have different causes, they have different locuses, different things, right? So well, the division I mean, of labor- Well, really. Oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Well, they do and I'll definitely get to that. So the division of labor that we're talking about in primitive societies uh -huh. was not based on a system of condescension. It wasn't based on a system of supremacy or patriarchy. So this is based on like a, like a need based survival system. Where, so where are you sourcing that information from? I can, I can throw the sources at you later. I don't well, know. I mean, if you have like a general, like just a general, where you heard this, because I've never heard this before. I mean, I have heard of some egalitarian, societies but not as a general mm. rule and uh the other thing is that even let's say i even grant you that let's say i we right. grant that um prehistoric societies were egalitarian that doesn't explain how all or many 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 thousands of other societies immediately after the prehistoric period were immediately patriarchal and <clears throat> often like had all kinds of other forms of um of like discrimination and and prejudice um pre i will get to that yeah but i mean it, it so, just seems very weird to make the claim that like white supremacy and um and institutionalized patriarchy are caused by capitalism when we have seen it in most of history to one degree or so another. i think also what we have to be very specific about it is white supremacy is a very new con Con concept and construct. So we're not talking about racism. Racism has been around forever, but white supremacy as a construct is literally, it's about 150 years old. It's very new, right? So mm, when I don't we're know. talking about, well, we can, we, can, we can get to that. But so I'm drawing on knowledge. I was an anthropology undergrad like over 10 years ago and I dropped out of college, yeah. you know? So I would have to go back and source all these things and i could do it but i just don't have it handy yeah but so what i'm trying to say is that when the agrarian revolution happened the reason why we see this institutionalization of patriarchy that's mm -hmm. accelerated as the uh what's a good way to say this as like people's material surplus uh raised right as people gain more uh, value currencies what have you is because it it, it followed a line of generational wealth uh -huh. so what started a lot of this from what many people um, point at is that now that you had this stockpile of resources, you wanted to make sure that it stayed in your family. So now you had a vested interest in making sure that you knew who your kid was, that you, you, you passed down your name to them, you passed mm -hmm. down your wealth to them, right? So from the agrarian revolution on is the beginning of institutionalized patriarchy. And then the more capital is accumulated, whether it's in uh, you know feudalistic mercantile like mercantile systems, uh, feudalistic capitalist systems, the more capital accumulation there is, it goes hand in hand with this system of patriarchy that ensures that if you want your kids to do well, you have to know who they are, they have to take your last name, and they have to inherit all your wealth. I and mean, then, but that but those structures are not capitalistic. Those existed like 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 literally hereditary monarchies are based off of that com concept and those are not capitalistic systems like at all so it seems like it's like again i know this is we've kind of gone off on this one but that is like in my opinion like it's a factual like factually incorrect to claim that capitalism causes institutionalized patriarchy or 
white supremacy even now maybe you could say certain if we really really if we like drill down super super precisely and and say that uh that like um you know white supremacy as we know it only existed the last 150 years well regardless i mean a cursory a cursory google search into wikipedia shows that the 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 slave the british slave trade started in 1066 that's long before we were talking about capitalism at all and that these were these largely a lot of these slaves were um like we're let's see here let's see i'm trying to look right here 15 1554 and 1555 was was when a massive slave trading syndicate of wealthy white merchants began trading uh in slaves that were captured in africa so that seems like like we've had these structures these these like structures that allow for otherization of people with different skin colors um and and their subjugation their domination has existed for much longer than capitalism so i i i, I still feel like there's so many holes in this claim that like it's caused by it that that's a pretty major flaw in the argument don't you think hello breakfast detective Hey, did you to disconnect? I'm so sorry. I did. Uh, my oh, okay. my my internet ran out, so I had to go on to on to on to Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. What was the last thing you remember me saying? Um, it cut out right as you were about to respond. I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. I can I can tell you. I did just like a cursory, quick like Wikipedia search just to get a basic ballpark. And yeah. uh, from what I can see here, the like English slave trade began in 1066 like formally and it was focused mostly at that time on like indigenous britons uh like mm -hmm. irish and scottish people um as we would understand them today but easily by by 1554 which is well pre-capitalism um there were there was a massive slave trading syndicate that was wealthy british merchants that specifically mm -hmm. targeted enslaved and dominated uh africans dark-skinned africans so right. again i i i take i i feel like there's multiple ways in which the claim that um white supremacy and inter institutionalized patriarchy are like constructs of capitalism is just fa false on its face like i don't see that so, there's any evidence of that so we could we could very easily from all the things that i just laid out we could maybe a better way to make this claim is to say that versus ex capitalism explicitly that in, that institutionalized patriarchy is a function of capital accumulation um, is probably a better way to say that. Okay. And then as far as white supremacy, hold on, I need to cough. I don't want to cough into your okay. chat's ears. Give me two seconds. Sure. Ooh. There we go. Um, when we're talking about white supremacy, we're not talking about bigotry or racism. Those things, you're absolutely right, have been around forever. Hmm. Uh, when we're talking, at least when I'm talking about white supremacy, what I'm talking about is the transitive property of whiteness, hmm. where we're looking at a system of exploitation where the, the capital owners in society need to find a way to break up the class solidarity of people at the bottom of the hierarchy, right? So, well, but I mean, that same thing that? would have happened, that, that same thing happened in feudalist societies as well. I mean, how do you think? Uh, how do you think it wait, Well, it absolutely did. How do you think that feudal societies decide who is okay to exploit or not exploit? It's so many times. that was determined essentially by their vulnerability, right? So when we're looking at these like uh, colonized societies that the British targeted, for instance, they were vulnerable to these external forces. They had the ability to just go in and snatch people out of their homes and enslave them, right? So I mean, how is that, that any point, different than what happens under capitalism? Like I, I feel like I'm, this is like that's a, what I'm trying to explain. There's a distinction without a difference. At least it just sounds like uh, all the only thing that's changing between these situations is your framing. And no, that no, no, means, no, no, no. It's not so the facts, when I'm, like, you're, let me let me get this thought out. Sure, sure, sure. So and then tell me tell me if this is horseshit or bad or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when I'm talking about white supremacy, what I'm talking about is the transitive property of whiteness. So when the British, for instance, started enslaving people. They recognized their national identities, and the people who were being enslaved recognized their own national identities. I'm Scottish. I'm Irish, etc. Right? Today, when we talk about white supremacy, we're not talking about explicitly someone's skin color or the concept of racism. 
We're talking about the transitive property of whiteness. I don't. And what uh, that I'm, I'm not familiar means. with that term, the transitive property of whiteness. I don't know what that means. What can you explain so to me? With, I've never heard of that term before. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so essentially, if you're let's use Ireland as an example because we were just just talking mm -hmm. about it. There are light skinned people in Ireland mm -hmm. called travelers, and they are yeah. indigenous people. They are nomadic. Mm -hmm. They're very akin to the Roma people in Western Europe, mm -hmm. but they are light skinned and they are not considered white. So in one place, you could be considered white, you go to a different place, you're no longer considered white, right? right? So in Egypt, if you go from Egypt to the United States, or like, for instance, my family is Turkish. So okay. if you are a Turk and you're in the Middle East, you're not considered white. If you come to the United States, you are considered white, sure. not only by the census, but of how many people would see you. So the transitive property of whiteness is endemic to white supremacy, and what that essentially does is it robs people of their national identities and says, you know, you are not Irish or Scottish or Turkish or Egyptian. You are all white. And the reason why the lowest common denominator, everyone based on kind of like a melanin density is specifically because they're trying to break up any sort of class consciousness or class solidarity that would occur between people who are easy to exploit by capitalists, Africans, uh, black Americans, and then people who come over with a sort of uh, privilege, right? Okay. People who have money, et cetera. But I mean, what you're explaining is just a phenomenon that like, like you're, you're explaining the process by which people other one another, and that's occurred in many societies. Like that's but not unique to What we're to talking capitalism. about here, so like when we look at <clears throat> excuse me when we look at the united states mm -hmm. even like 200 years ago right mm -hmm. what we see is this tapestry of what today we would consider white but then they considered national identities irish people italian people etc today they are all considered white if you ask an well, italian yeah, but american like, I, I don't disagree with you on the idea that whiteness can be modified and is modified in many many ways right. but all that you're describing here is that white that what whiteness is can change and therefore who's included in white supremacy can change that doesn't that doesn't that argument i don't disagree with you on that idea that doesn't prove the idea that capitalism causes institutionalized patriarchy or white supremacy do you see how that right. those so, those two don't yeah, follow yeah 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 so let me let me let me try to see if i can do a better job of bridging that uh, connection mm -hmm. so this is something that uh kind of spurned out of the early 20th century labor movements in the United States, where all of a sudden you would see pre Jim, Jim, Jim Crow, mm -hmm. um, black Americans and white indentured poor Americans banding together in labor move like move movements. You had the farmer labor party, for instance, you had a lot of movements nationally of all of these different people banding together. Sure. So capital in like in, in, in interests, excuse me, go, how do we how do we break this up right mm -hmm. so there's a million different ways that they attack this issue they change mm -hmm. the census they change the textbooks they change the naming they put forth new new messaging on the radio they they put forth media restrictions of how to refer to people there's like a million different ways that okay. this happened right it was like drip fed but the end goal of this is to create two separate groups of people okay. white people and non-white people okay. And the reason why they're doing that is because they want to divide people and disrupt their class solidarity. Okay. So yeah, but again, though, again, though, again, though, you're beginning. just describing something. You're describing a phenomena that exists in our current system that is not evidenced by it being like created by the system. Because I could argue the exact same thing about how about the maneuvers that 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 uh, nobles took against peasants. Like it was like. This is like a huge part of medieval history is like nobles bribing right. peasants, turning them against each other. You're just talking about struggle. You're just describing mm -hmm. struggle and how that struggle unfolds. I don't think that so there's what I'm, what... evidence that like, again, I know we've been st sticking on this point. I have other arguments I can make against your other yeah. your other points if you want to move on from this particular one. But I just I don't sure. believe that there's any evidence that these things are created or caused by capitalism. Yes, are they utilized by capitalism? 100%. But they've been utilized. I mean, and, and it gets even more, uh, even if you want to say, again, 
even if I grant you in this case, and I don't, but even if I did grant you that, okay, maybe, maybe white supremacy is created by capitalism. Homophobia certainly isn't. Patriarchy is of absolutely course. not. They're absolutely not created by capitalism. And if that's the case, then we can conclude that capitalism is not the only system that has employed these things to turn people against one another. And therefore, um, we cannot only consider capitalism. So my, my, maybe, maybe, maybe right in that a reframing would, would be good. If we look at non-capitalist systems that don't have this impetus to uh, flatten this like racial division in society or however we want to call this, mm -hmm. like, let's take the Soviet Union for a example. Okay. The Soviet Union was very big on preserving national identities within the Soviet Union. So you had a lot of different of these SRs. You had Jewish Soviet republics. You had Georgian. You had Azerbaijani. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet Union at no point made an attempt to tell all of these people that they were identical. It respected each of their individual national identities, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different characters who would, would all of those to... people agree that that's the case. Because I don't. Uh, well, know if, if you're that's... going by the referendum, if when the Soviet Union was uh, dissolved, then yes, at least seventy percent of the of the, the people. Damn, that thirty percent's a pretty huge amount that doesn't feel like they're being respected. And also, to be fair, um, it's not black and white. It's seventy well, yeah, percent I mean, emphatically also, yes, and then and then ten to fifteen percent yes, and then five to ten percent no. Hmm. Okay, I mean and that's I'll... that's to be fair, not probably the best like touchstone for this, right? Yeah. Oh, this link is pretty interesting. The russification, interesting. Yeah, it looks like it looks like there's quite a so, there's like... quite a lot of of ethnic and yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I mean, again, I. I this feels like very very broad strokes claims that don't right. that i don't think like i mean and also like anti-semitism was a huge problem in russia like mm. there were russian jews but there was huge problems with anti-semitism in russia like this has been this is something I, I've, I would, I've had I discussions would need with a, a lot of people. citation for that yeah i mean if you don't believe it was like i i don't know like w i don't know how to cite you that like that there was like huge the issues soviet union yeah. created a special uh national country for Jewish people who wanted their own uh, place to live, they wanted their own place to control within the Soviet Union, which a lot of people don't know about. When like the lead up to World War II was like happening, right? Yeah. And Jewish people across Europe were getting deported and excommunicated and, and all this stuff. The Soviet Union welcomed them with open arms and said, you are welcome here. And then yeah. there was this movement of Jewish people in the Soviet Union we said, okay, great, but like, I don't want to just like assimilate to your culture. I want to celebrate my own culture. So they created a like an SR, a Soviet re Republic of explicitly Jewish people mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. So it seems like I don't know, like on its face, like I, I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but it seems a little dubious that a country who would go so far as to create mm -hmm. an autonomous zone for Jewish people would then be anti-Semitic. I don't understand how that. I mean, wait, wait, hold on. Like, I'm not saying that a country that like the the country as a whole was anti-Semitic. That seems very essentialist. I'm just saying that these problems still exist, even in countries that manage oh, to move whoa, 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 away from whoa, whoa. capitalism. Oh, yeah. So yeah. so basically this this kind of comes full circle to what we were talking about. So Lenin talks about this and what he calls it is Russian chauvinism. Right. And <clears throat> the reason why I'm not a big fan of the word chauvinism is because it's not precise enough, you know, like chauvinism does not include uh, queer or trans liberation, um, mm -hmm. but intersectionality does, right? So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a semantic difference, but I think an important one. And Lenin talked about this in the frames of the Russian people uh, were heavily chauvinistic and they needed this deep, uh, they, they needed this like deep-seated root uh, excised out of them that would allow them or empower them or enable them or however you want to re refer to it as, but to be more welcoming of all different kinds of people, right? So I don't disagree with your point at all, but what I'm saying is we have two systems, right? We have one that's pouring gasoline on a fire and then one that's trying to put it out. Hmm. And when we're talking about intersectionality as the basis of our theory, right? And not as a basis of our practice, because I agree with that. But as a basis of our theory, 
what we're saying is we're trying to put out when the fire like licks out, when it jumps out and lights something else on fire, we go, no, 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 and we put that out. But the fire is still raging. There's still all these different motivating factors that are contributing for all of these different things, right? Okay. Well, uh, okay, this was another thing that, that I wanted to address that I think we're now like sort of looping back into from what you claimed at the beginning, which is that like class underlies and, and runs as an undercurrent under all other intersectionalities. And that is like explicitly anti, that is explicitly non-intersectional. Like the idea of intersectionality is that class is one, perhaps a strong one, but it is one of many different things. And um, the easiest way that I can bring um, the the easiest way that I can bring uh, attention to this is that uh, is somebody like um, Caitlyn uh, Caitlyn Jenner, you know, Caitlyn okay. Jenner. Uh, she has a massive platform, a massive massive wealth advantage, like l truly like one percent level of riches um one of the richest people in the world yet nonetheless suffers an incredible amount of hatred and re uh rejection based on her identity and mm -hmm. and i use kate i always like to talk about caitlin jenner because caitlin jenner is um herself like a very very politically uh problematic individual uh, in my opinion mm -hmm. like really bad takes on some things but and I don't right, think anybody right. would argue um, that her class position has uh, has completely insulated her from the pain of transphobia. And, and in fact, I would argue that that's like for most of her life, she clearly was struggling um, from the suffering that comes from being trans in our society, how long she was in the right. closet and hid it. Um, and and if that's the case, like that would that would an intersectional like an inter an intersectional analysis would say yes that makes sense while class can insulate you from a lot you can't be fully insulated from other types of prejudice and 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 uh, discrimination that exists in our society and right that seems to be very true um i have not seen like i've never seen an example of somebody whose class was able to make them immune to racism or immune to homophobia it could perhaps reduce the pain just like um just like in the same way that a white gay person has is much less likely to have as much trouble as a black gay person in america exactly but being but why? White alone, why is that the case but being, why is that well, the case hold on there's a couple of well there's a number of reasons why that's the case um okay. for example um like there's well first of all there is the um it, let's say all else is equal so um you know both members of the same like level of class maybe upper middle class or whatever um there are literal treatments that are purely based on your identity that cannot be ameliorated based on because of just because of class like for example right. um a a a black gay person who walks into a store and is browsing around looking at stuff is significantly more likely, regardless of their class history, regardless of where they come from, anything like that, is way more likely to get the secu get security called on them, um, be identified and treated poorly in public um, than a white gay person. That's just that's just true. That's how these things right. work, and this is why an intersectional analysis is important, in my opinion. And the idea that class underlies like runs under all of those other things is in my opinion definitively non-intersectional because it makes the argument that your class is independent of all these other intersectionalities and it isn't um in fact they interact with one another sometimes p part of the reason right. why you don't have access to uh to advancing your class position is specifically because of your skin color because of the history right. yeah like do, do you see so now so now let me let me let me posit you a question why do you think let's say like you were saying all things created equal why do you think that uh let's say a cis white gay has a mm -hmm. different experience in the united states versus a cis black gay well i mean most i mean honestly if all else is equal their skin color well yeah right but i'm yeah. saying like when we're talking about this, like the one thing that I can't help but come back to yeah. is we're talking about these like individualized cri cri critiques of like one person or another person. Well, we're looking and, at like, these to find clues of, of whether it's actually true that right. class underlies all things. And I would argue that's not true. But what I'm talking about are systems, are large scale systems that are above and beyond 
each individual person. So there are plenty of examples of people, uh, for instance, black people who are insulated by their class privilege, which prevents them from encountering the same sort of bigotries and difficulties that a poor black person would. And the same thing for Caitlyn Jenner. Well, yes, right? so but again, Caitlyn all Jenner else being does equal. not experience. Well, that's why we do I'm all just saying, being equal. Caitlyn, I'm, I'm just saying, so let's take two different trans people, right? Let's say okay. one of them has class, class, class privilege, right? Uh -huh. And backing up a step, I'm talking about the Marxist definition of classes. So you have your plebeian proletariat, petit bourgeois, and sure, sure. bourgeois. Uh -huh. So Caitlyn Jenner is not a bourgeois. She's not part of the bourgeoisie. She's not a owner and steer of market That's forces. False. Uh, That's false. Okay, well, I mean, what I'm saying is, is if Caitlyn Jenner decides not to buy oil or steel futures, nobody blinks an eye, right? Well, yeah, but that's not, but that's the same thing goes for any individual of the membership of the of the of the bourgeoisie. There's a very very small amount of people whose individual actions can like blow up a market. That's like Elon Musk but and those like those are the exactly, but those are the people we're talking about. Ah. As as a Marxist myself, I don't have any sort of you know, a uh, severe bone to pick with the petit bourgeois, except as an obstacle They're not, that's to revolution. not petit bourgeois. Petit bourgeois is like, I mean, okay, and I don't know, maybe we're operating on different things, but my understanding of petit bourgeois is like, like the owners of a bakery or the owners of like a, sh of a shop, people who have, who do own land and they do own something, but they don't own enough that they're, that they can like be distinguished uh, in class interest from the the everyday worker to a significant degree that was my understanding of the of the petty bourgeois caitlin jenner is not petty bourgeois by no definition i don't think you could i think that would be a ridiculous claim caitlin jenner is one of so the i would i was just gonna say i would argue that she absolutely is but i think that's also kind of aside from the point that we were making before okay the point that i was making before is that let's say you are a wealthy black person in the united states okay. let's say you are bourgeois you can afford anything you blink and you want it it's there right so okay. if you are thinking to yourself hey you know i might be discriminated against the police if i drive i'll hire a driver right mm -hmm. boom now you don't experience that same level of class antagonism just right there right so there are ways that your class will insulate you from the Wait, same sort no, of bigotries that, that I mean, other people experience. Yeah, but that's why we said all else being equal. That's like a like you're making you're making an, an argument for a different a, a completely different thing. You're 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 not like nobody's arg I've never argued against that. Like I recognize that class can insulate you from some things, but it can't insulate right. you from all. And like uh for example, like I, I like the example that I gave you, unless you're saying that like, oh, a rich black person could literally hire someone to go to the store for them and all of these things, which is true. Of course, uh, which, which is true. Could. But do you, but keep in mind that the fact that that would be necessary, that in order to avoid racism, that plays to my point, the idea that race is such a major intersection that class cannot override it in, in its entirety. Not unless but you in literally... that example you just gave, class literally overrides it. No, it doesn't. You it have over, the, it they may, have it the may class lessen, power. It may lessen certain aspects of it. That is not. That is not like what I, that is not what I'm saying. Like, wait, wait, you're you're saying that if it can lessen it at all, then that means it overrides it. But that's not true. Again, I'm saying if it can lessen it to the point where it's not the same experience as the majority, then it's indistinct. Like, right, it, but if it is I... distinct. A, a, and here's a great example. You can talk like look at the look at the like insanely, insanely rich um, uh, like uh, like 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 sports people like i'm trying to think of like a colin kaepernick or somebody like that who's like ridiculously rich obviously not petty bourgeois um and he it, is petty bourgeois okay i think you have a non-accurate definition of petty bourgeois i'm just gonna say that right where here. where are you grabbing your definition from maybe uh, that's a good way to i mean my definition kind of was based page. off what i had read of 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 what i have read of marx and what i have read of of uh like summaries of marx that's where I okay, pull my so, definition from. And and I could be wrong. I'm open to being wrong on the idea of of petty bourgeois being extendable to multimillionaires who have huge like it stock ownership. Absolutely is. Absolutely is. 
So when we're talking yeah, about bourgeois on, characters, let's, let's, for instance, I mean, uh, let's, let's get on the same page. Sure. Let's let me say here, petty bourgeois. Let's see if we can get a, a working definition here. Okay. Let's see. See here. The lower middle class is what the dictionary definition is. And let's take a look in, in an expanded uh, in an expanded wikipedia definition a french term referring to a social class composed of semi-autonomous peasantry and small-scale merchants whose politic who politico economic ideological stance in times of socio-economic stability is determined by reflecting that of a high bourgeois with which the petty bourgeois seeks to identify itself and whose bourgeois morality it, it strives to imitate that does not so like that does not describe by any means, any of the people we've discussed. Here we go. Here's modern so, day examples based off of the Communist okay. Manifesto. Small business owners, minority shareholders, franchise owners, aka somebody who owns like a single like subway restaurant, lawyers okay. working in small partnerships, and private GP practices. That's like a doctor that owns their own practice. None of those sure. are NFL superstars. All of those people you, you described, by the way, are millionaires. Every single one of them. No, that's not true. Yes, literally every single one of them. I guarantee Wait, you. I'm sorry. Every single one of these people that I've explained here, a franchise owner, a small a minority shareholder. Millionaire. Wrong. I am a minority okay. shareholder. What are you a minority shareholder? AMC. In? I bought in for the memes. <laughs> Demon Mama, I love you. So I don't think that's no, what they're talking no, I, about. Like, I get that you're laughing, but you're just wrong. You're just factually wrong on this. And it's like, okay, so uh, like no, you're it's just, just funny that you would say fact. that because owning owning a share does not mean you're a minority. Yes, shareholder. it does. A minority shareholder. So when they're talking about minority shareholder, they're talking about people who are on the board of directors who don't have the. You're bending over backwards to just avoid being ex... wrong. Just admit that you're wrong. No, the I'm not. Of I'm just saying. Wrong. I'm saying you don't understand the definition. I'm trying yes, to explain this to you. Yes, I do. Wait, wait. So when we're you're okay. you're trying to argue with me that some of the richest people in America. Oh, would be categorized as petty bourgeois and that's just ridiculous right. that's a ridiculous claim so what, they don't have any so what shared... we're talking about oh my god what we're talking about as marxist would you identify yourself as a as a marxist no say we? Okay, okay no i identify so, myself as a lefty with anarch uh, anarchic leanings that's about it i don't really love this this like badge game that people play okay so it's not a badge game for me it's a it's a it's a materialist view of analysis in history so when I'm talking about characters who are bourgeois, I'm talking about characters like the Waltons, who, if they decided that they wanted to uh, move in one direction or another, it would alter the market, right, in a significant way. So we can say that there's a gray area, there's a transitionary period, depending on a certain amount of wealth in the modern economy, how much a wealthy person decides to do, and like the way that so many things are like, are built around celebrity nowadays like you might not necessarily have the same amount of wealth but you might have a large amount of like power or influence in the market because of your celebrity status like here for that well i mean That's specifically awesome. though i mean i'm looking at this right here and the specific definitions used by marx was not to determine was not to talk about how much individual money you had but how right. they stand but your relationship to the market your relationship to the market is totally different as somebody who's a a literal who who may, who pulls in millions upon millions of dollars per year and is able and then immediately invest that back who has who has product deals like those are completely different than like right, a right, right. so those jeff people... bezos makes 25 million dollars an hour so if you make a million dollars a year you are not in the same class that he is if you make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a game or for a speaking arrangement you are not in the same class he is so what well, we're talking maybe, about maybe have you is considered that class like, like old old Marxist terms are like pretty bad for determining like modern class differences because I would argue that as far as class interest is concerned the interest of like of somebody like Bezos is indeed much closer to somebody like a like I don't know like a a John Travolta or an actor who's who has multiple houses like yeah like of course uh, of course a, a Bezos is like more it's magnified but their class interest is the same right. they're both landholders they both own so much that they could never be it could never be meanful, meaningfully taken away from them they could never they will never be impacted so their class interests are functionally the same I think your definition of the bourgeoisie that means that there's further. like five people in the world who categorizes bourgeoisie but the fact of the matter is that Jeff Bezos is is a rarity but 
Jeff Bezos is a rarity in the scale, but there are many, many people who's, who own who own so much, who have so much holdings that they would fall within the exact same class interests. There's there's millions. So, I mean, these people mama, just don't would, have fancy, fa fa like famous names. So to your point, like mm -hmm. I'll I'll kind of meet in the middle here. So I agree in that okay. you know hundred and. 170 year old political philosophy like probably could stand to do with some updating like mm -hmm. i agree but if we're talking about whose class interest aligning i would i would extend it even further and i would say from people like jeff bezos all the way down to people who make like sixty thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. that their class interests are very similar and the the what's it called the barrier for entry of what marx would have considered a petite bourgeois in our modern economy is much lower than he would have expected and much higher than he would have an anticipated. So it's a it's a I large class of I think that's incoherent. People. I'm sorry, but I think that is an incoherent analysis that basically is so broad as to be basically allow you to just justify anything under that argument. I think that's ridiculous. No, no, no. Like what well, well, what we're talking in America about... is like like depending on where you live, that's like poverty line. No, it's absolutely not poverty line. Yeah, it's so, very close. So the median wage of Americans, I think, is somewhere around yeah, but median it, wage doesn't matter. Thirty six thousand dollars. We're talking about regional. Well, this is ridiculous. It's thirty two to thirty six thousand dollars an hour, um, and that's including billionaires. If you take them out of it, the wage drops by like six to eight thousand dollars, right? So if you're talking regionally, the average, let's say, rental cost of an american is around twelve hundred dollars nationally and when we do things nationally we lose a lot of details but just to bear with the just point, so you know right? just so, so you know um people in, here in where here where i live yeah i don't know i again i don't know how this qualifies like how this actually ties back to class reductions in which i would really like to get on to um but i'm looking right now at the at the the seattle standards because i live in seattle i'm looking at the standards mm -hmm. for people who would be considered uh who would qualify for low income public housing, a two member household at 80% of their of their annual monthly income, which is I was the, just about to say like, that. Yeah, 70 76,000. Yeah, so 76, if, you're, if you're talking about if you're it's 66,000. Yeah, so what we're saying You you're, you're okay, just wrong. On. Your hold claims on. are wrong. You just you're you're running over me. I need to be able to respond. Okay. Okay. So the if if you were what they typically refer to as a quarter of your income going towards your rent in the united states you'd make need to make at least 30 dollars and 74 cents an hour to be able to hit that barrier right Damn. so i am not saying that people who make sixty thousand dollars are petit bourgeois i'm saying their class interests are the same i'm saying the people who make money in society and who are doing at least okay or decently well have the same class interests as people who are doing extremely well no. right and the whole point of elucidating this is the people at the very top and the very bottom are very far from one another, right? We have over 60 million people in the country, in the United States. That's, what is that? That's like a fifth, right? We have a fifth of the of the country, uh, either a, close to the poverty line or below, right? Mm -hmm. So like what we're talking about is there's a huge section of society that has a completely different way of living than the people at the top. So to bring this full circle all the way back to Wait, class re 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 reduction. Okay, sure. Did, did you want to say something? No, I, I just am extremely confused. Like, I think that most of these claims that you've thrown out here are just patently false. Like, just... Oh, can, you, can you demonstrate that? Yeah, like, a great example is, like, uh, saying that, like, the class interests of, of Jeff Bezos and, and like... Uh, and like somebody who like owns a, a single fan like a family owned restaurant are at all the same except in the mm. very like in the like marxian understanding of the petty bourgeois which is that they are fooled to think that they are the same um and therefore they act aspirationally towards those those highest of the bourgeois that's ridiculous that seems ridiculous to me and also the idea that 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 you could sh that somebody like caitlin jenner could share a class with like somebody who owns like like even even somebody who owns like three local restaurants and have shared class interests even whether they think like not of that they actually the the interest that they think but like their actual class interest is is just mathematically ridiculous it's not true as somebody so who, this is 
sorry go on yeah because somebody who owns like i mean people who own three restaurants who would be considered like upper middle class um or whatever um are like they have nothing no actual shared interest with um like a caitlin jenner type caitlin jenner's holdings and and uh wealth is so high the uh, caitlin jenner wasn't affected isn't going to be affected by COVID at all but these no. but many many re small restaurateurs who own like a handful of of restaurants even which would be considered very good by the standards of most americans those people are bankrupt now a lot of them are bankrupt right. now so that's not true your claims aren't so true. let me let me kind of take it out of the marxist framework and maybe make it a little bit more pragmatic and sure and let's try here. yeah i uh, sorry because i was under the assumption that you were marxist so uh, maybe i can back up a little bit so i mean i think i take a lot of inspiration from marx i just don't identify with the term marxist okay okay yeah. right on right on um, so when I say that their class interests are the same, I say that they like, like, again, what we're talking about is the relationship to the market, right? So uh -huh. if you were to ask someone who makes a couple million dollars a year, if they want socialized healthcare, for instance, if they want like an end to commodity production or something along those lines, however, the, however the hell you would, you would, you, you know, put this across to them, sure. right? They would say, absolutely not. And all of those people who benefit from the system, despite how well they are benefiting, would all say something to the effect of, no, I only wish I could benefit more. And if you were to talk to people at the very bottom of society, people who are doing shitty, homeless people, people who, you know, uh, like work two, three jobs, mm -hmm. like have a kid they need to take care of on top of that, right? And you ask them, hey, do you want socialized medicine? They mm -hmm. would say, yeah, totally. And by a large percentage, they uh, would. If you were to tell them, okay. hey, do you want I don't easy think that's access? True. It's very true. So it's actually I... it's so true that if if you ask uh, by in, like income, if you make, I don't remember the exact amount of it, but it's such a huge margin. It's like it's like over seventy or eighty percent of Americans who make under certain income agree that like Medicare for all is their is their health care plan. Right right, right and, now. I mean, now that the idea sure. has been popularized, but go back two years ago, that wasn't the case. Well, I'm talking about the case right at all. Now. Yeah, but I mean, but that doesn't that doesn't that right doesn't now support is your have. argument. No, it's I mean, it's not. That's like saying you ignore the historical record. Like Americans have, for most of our history, poor Americans have been capitalists. They have no Americans have no class consciousness whatsoever. You're just so wrong I, about oh, these claims. Ooh, these are, ooh, oh my God, Demon Mama! I need to we need to like red pill you on labor history. This is not the case at all. Americans used to be the kind of people who would de-arrest widows from the repossession of their farms. All right, listen, used to be the listen, all right, would... hold on a second here. Okay. I know a lot about American labor history, probably more than you. Now, if you want to, if you want to do the, 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 like, oh, we got a red pill or whatever, we can, we can do a little bit of dunking if we want to do dunking, but no, I, no, no, I, I don't think I'm I've not been about dunking. I'm about here. having a nice conversations, right? Yeah, so listen, what I, I'm, what I'm I talking about here Americans is... at various points and in certain pockets have had some sense of class consciousness, but for a very long okay, time, that is not the case. I mean, literally, this is the country at wh in which we, uh, in which the, the term uh, temporarily embarrassed millionaires originated mm -hmm. from because so many Americans buy into the American dream, even working class Americans. And I would say that's the case ah, to this day. Demon Baba, I love you. That's exactly the point I was going to make before about similar class interests between a restaurateur and a billionaire. The restaurateur considers themselves a temporarily embarrassed billionaire. None of this they supports your point, though. Same this, class is just, interest. this is just... This, none of this no, but I'm, the I'm, I'm making. literally making the point and I'm answering your question and you're saying, no, nah, that's not true. No. So like, which is it? Is... Like you are literally making the same point that I am, no, but I'm you're not. disagreeing with it if I make it, but you're agreeing with it if you that's make not, it. I just don't understand not, how that that's tracks. That's not true at all. What I, I made a distinction between a petty, the petty bourgeois who the entire mm -hmm. distinction, as far as I can tell from everything I've ever read about the petty bourgeois, the key distinction about the petty bourgeois why they're their own category and not just called bourgeois is because oh no i had a hold on a second my stream is mm -hmm. having an issue is okay there okay uh people may need to re, re reload re refresh yeah that's a little weird Chat, slam that f5 button. slam that f5 yeah exactly um so okay the the petty bourgeois the reason why they're a distinct class is because they share their actual class interests are with the working class. They are very, very oh. close. And the, yes, their actual 
interests are with the working class. They're perceived interests. They are aspirationally bourgeois. Now, that doesn't, by the way, just so you know, there are plenty of working class people who also um, think that they are that they're destined for the bourgeois and they act as that right. as that's the case but the petty bourgeois actually do have some holdings but not enough to actually distinguish them from the working class in any truly meaningful sense in times again it, the definition that i am pulling up right here that's pulled straight from marx is that they that during times of economic stability they believe that their interests are with the bourgeois and they they act accordingly now I would say that somebody like, again, Caitlyn Jenner is a great example of somebody who, the whole, where this whole thing started, is somebody who is not petty bourgeois. Like, Caitlyn Jenner is absolutely bourgeois. In times of economic instability, Caitlyn Jenner is still going to be fine, perfectly fine. Uh, so Caitlyn Jenner's holdings are so broad that they're not going to be, and, and they're not going to be disabled by any sort of natural disaster. They're completely insulated, hence bourgeois. I think a broad- But Mama, when we're making class distinctions, we're not talking about people's individualized wealth. We're talking about their relationship to the economy. Yeah, That's and, the and Caitlyn Jenner's re re like, uh, relationship to the market and to the economy is completely different than that of a small business owner. Hence why Marx, Marx made this argument, made this distinction. So, so I don't... like, I would, so like that, like, that's the thing. Like, you know, I don't know enough about Caitlyn Jenner or like okay. her wealth Pick or her else, holdings then. necessarily comments like in depth, but like, sure. I'm willing to concede that, you know, Caitlyn Jenner very well might be a bourgeois character. I don't know enough about her. I mean, RuPaul is another I'm... great example. RuPaul is, is, uh, mm -hmm. a, another person literally owns like, like a considerable not even like a small amount not like a single pump jack in texas or whatever they like like Kate, like rupaul owns a massive amount of fracking materials they're like like right rupaul's relationship with the economy is not that of the same of a of a of a business owner that like owns a single restaurant not even close Okay, sure. But I think to bring this full circle to what we were talking about, yeah. their class privilege allows them to insulate themselves from the bigotry that other people experience. If you're but it a trans sex worker, it absolutely does. If you're if you're a trans sex worker in New York City, for instance, until, by the way, very recently, chat, they just repealed what's been referred to as the trans, uh, I think it's a streetwalker, quote unquote, ban, okay. which essentially made it so that if you were uh, perceived in any way of being engaged in sex work in New York City, you could be stopped, uh, hassled, arrested, etc. Okay. And it almost exclusively applied to trans people in New York City. Okay. So if you are someone of that class, class position, uh -huh. you don't have the ability to insulate yourself from it. You are always subjected to it all the time. Yeah, but you're talking if about, you are, yes, you're talking about, you're talking about being able to insulate from some, but not all. And, and but I can, again, I can this give is you not an individualized examples. critique. Yeah, but, but that's you the can't, thing. Like, you, you, you can you're, give you're me, switching you can give me a million you, examples of this. Yeah, but, but I'm not. On a I'm just saying level, this is not an though, individualized wait, but you're, wrong on a, you know, you're wrong on a systemic level as well. Because systemically, even rich, even rich or upper class trans people cannot insulate themselves from all of the effects of transphobia. What you are arguing here is anti-intersectional. So I understand no, no, if you no, don't no, believe no. in intersectionality, it's fine. You can just say I don't. But what you are arguing no, is anti-intersectional. I, I I disagree with that take entirely. Well, Dino, you're because what we're I mean, talking about is you, proportionality. You... We're talking about proportionality. We're doesn't... not talking in black and white terms. We're talking proportionality. You said at the beginning of this conversation, and I confirmed with you and started it off with you, that class underlies all other intersectionalities, which is an explicitly anti-intersectional take. Yes. And if you I, still I, stand I by that, then, well, you're I wrong. Do. You're def definitionally wrong. Intersectionality is the idea that you can, that one single uh, intersection, that one single path cannot insulate you from all the others that you if you are a black person in america there are some things that you functionally cannot insulate yourself from one way or another and the best example i would give of this is a bourgeois black person who is able to uh send out somebody to buy things for them still ha the, the fact that they have to do that that they would have to do that at all and now have to live a life of 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 isolation in their home in order to avoid that well i mean some form of luxury but i would argue that that i mean being, come on who wait, wants wait, to go wait, to the wait, supermarket wait wait <laughs> who wants to go to the supermarket i mean we're talking about like we were talking about like the example of somebody who could avoid the, the, what you would have to do to avoid all 
um, racism is you'd have to do things like change your name. You'd have to do, I'd say probably the person who came closest to this was probably Michael Jackson in that Michael Jackson literally went through extensive painful procedures to completely whiten his skin. Like this is, it, it, it would be absurd to claim that these people are insulated from racism. They're not. Maybe, maybe, think, maybe they've dampened the blow a little bit, but that goes to that, the intersectional argument. Come on, you, you, come on, Demon Mama. You know it's much more than a little bit. Come on, be honest. Wait you a minute, it's, it's not a matter of, a wait, your, 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 your argument would have is to say. proportionality. It's, it's much more than a little bit. It's not, but your argument. Come on. I don't, I don't understand, like. I feel like you're failing to acknowledge what I'm telling you here, which is that yes, class is is powerful. It can insulate you from certain things, but it cannot insulate right. you from others. And if it can insulate you from that thing uh, in one way, the cost is usually quite extensive. For example, I would argue- That's my point. <laughs> That's literally my point, Demon Mama. No, my point I don't think it is, is that class can insulate you from other forms of oppression. And when we're well, talking about of what underlies well. forms we've, of oppression, but, no, 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 this it's is, this is capitalism and capital this is, accumulation. This is ridiculous because we've had we've been going around on this, but I've brought up the fact right. that all types, all intersectionalities can insulate or pad you from other from the damages of other intersections. That is an intersectional analysis. But the idea that class over like overpowers all of them to the degree it doesn't that you overpower should any of them. That was never my point. <sighs> It, you just said that that was the case. Oh my God. No, no, no. What I said was that it undercuts all of them. Overpowering and under underwriting them are completely different things. They're literally the opposite things. Mm -hmm. They're literally the opposite things. What I'm saying is that your class privilege has the ability to insulate you from the majority of oppressions that you mm. might experience. Not all. That's I, literally the point I've been making I, this I entire think, time. Uh, I don't think that you can make a case that's that clear because every single rich person who happens to belong to another minority identity, although their life might be significantly better, because yes, I will agree, class is very important in America. Um, but the idea that they're like that they live free of 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 the oppressions of their specific class is ridiculous. It's, but it's you're literally strawmanning me right now. I never yes, but, said that. But, I never even claimed you, to why, say that. But you, you have. You argued. No, for I literally said the opposite. You're Wait, arguing listen. against a strawman position of me. BD, no, 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 hold BD. on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I love you, but you got to let me reiterate my point. No, my because point this is, is like... that these things underride all of these other things, and the the massive amount of propensity, what causes a lot of these different types of oppression, are not just in the air. We you can have, make the question. argument that it's a type of so, like chauvinism, but inevitably it is fueled by capitalism. Let me ask you something real quick. Um, yes. Under And this is in our capitalist system. You can pick a year, um, including this year if you want to. Uh, do you not acknowledge that a glass ceiling exists, for example, for women? Can you kind of expand on that a little bit? I think so. Like the but idea like, that just women kind of can only on get so high before they're prevented because they're a woman. I think it's very dependent on what what situation you're talking okay. about. Okay. Well, what if right? we what if we dial it back just a few years? What about the 90s? Do you think it would be do you think it was possible in the 90s for a woman to rise to the top uh the top position in like science or law or sports for that matter? Oh, this is so, this is so hard for me to generalize for because like for Okay, well then let's roll back a little bit. Who... What about the 70s when women no, 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 no. Hold women on, hold could on, hold even on. hold what bank I'm, accounts? What I'm talking about is for hundreds of years women have risen to these positions but they have been overridden they have been ignored they've been censured like it's kind of hard for me to like like what how many what how many exactly female presidents going? do we have in the united states mm -hmm. literally zero yeah how many black right. presidents did we have until obama i mean you already know the answer to that yeah i know what I'm saying is, is that you cannot rise to these positions because there are hard lines that are identity based. And there's many of these, by the way, a, mu a Muslim holding the fucking pre president will not happen. Not for decades, probably, unfortunately. And these are hard lines that doesn't matter how fucking rich you are. Hillary Clinton is crazy fucking rich, crazy rich and crazy powerfully in influence, cannot raise to, to the presidency. And I'm not gonna lie, large amount of that is because of misogyny like objectively we've studied mm -hmm. this there's like a fuckload yeah. of people that just literally agreed with H hillary clinton on everything and did not vote 
So that there argues was, I think, that, I think that at your least position, twelve to fifteen percent of people who refuse to vote for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman, and that includes Democrats. Yes, thank you for for like ceding your position to me because what you've done no, now I'm is you've illustrated like the fact that no, a, a we cannot that, that 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 class cannot override or even insulate you from all of the effects of identity based discrimination, which is why intersectionality again, like, so is so is... essential to understand. But Demon Mama, again, you're you're arguing against a straw man in my position. I'm trying to inject a little nuance into this conversation. Okay. So at no point did I ever say uh -huh. that it's a black and white game. I'm of the philosophy you argued, that black wait, and white... This... Okay, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, I'm of the philosophy that black and white thinking is a thought distortion. I don't think that that's an accurate way to conceptualize anything. Mm -hmm. None of this is black and white. What I'm saying is that class is what ties all of this together, right? Like, like let's, so let's- Do you remember what the topic was that we started this bit. conversation on? Yes, okay. and I'm gonna, I'm gonna class if you're permitted, I'll reorient this a little bit. Sure, let's so, go for it, let's try to reorient. So what, what, what would you say, because like maybe we could do a little bit of back and forth question. Yeah, that'd be great. What would, what would you say might be a good solution or are there any examples that you can think of where these types of institutionalized oppressions did not exist, whether it's racism, sexism, transphobia, queerphobia, you name it. What? Can you ask that again? Sorry, I don't know what you're asking me. Okay, yeah. So uh, it's like a two-parter, right? So okay. on one hand, right, what, do you, what would you suggest as the fix for these different things that we're talking about? And then two, are there any historical examples that you can draw on where these weren't the case on an institutionalized epidemiological level when what when th these weren't the case do what do you mean by that when these when you mean like discrimination wasn't the case right these forms no. of bigotry whether we, it's racism sexism oh we've had various ones that have waxed and waned over time but no i don't think there's ever been a time when we've defeated them i don't think we're at that point yet um hopefully we someday will but it will probably be a while before we get there and then secondly do i have examples of of cases where like uh like class solidarity was like undermined specifically on identity um yeah tons um basically all of american history oh, that's what i was asking oh okay then maybe i'm miss maybe i'm just not understanding the question then okay maybe i can kind of shoot you an example and then we can riff sure 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 bit. yeah so in the Soviet Union, my favorite country, um, uh, one of the things that they did in their constitution was ensure that uh, women in society or uterus havers, however we want to re re refer to people as, um, had constitutionally guaranteed rights and protections, mm -hmm. what today uh, is called the Equal Rights Amendment in the United States. Okay. So what that means is you know, women had the ability to own property, they had the ability to marry as they see fit, uh, divorce, uh, they could mm -hmm. work any, any number of jobs that they wanted to. Their rights in society were constitutionally pr protected, and as a result, the amount of violence and discrimination that they experienced also lessened over time. So I would sideline that with, in the United States, especially from, excuse me, especially from the first and second wave feminist movement, we have not seen a significant lessening in the amount of gender-based violence that has occurred in the United States, but in, in some ways it has changed forms, right? Uh, that is a, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's true. I think, I thought we were at like an all time low for most types of violence in our country, like until very recently. Like we had a, we've had like a, a recent spike over the last few years because of like Trump coming in and like whipping up the most re reactionary elements of our society. But I thought that we've had like right. pretty significant um, decrease in like, like, um, yeah, I don't know if that's true. That seems like a bit of yeah, a. Yeah, so. Um, yeah. So it's no, so it's but definitely I don't, I gone down. I still don't down. understand what you're trying to get at here. Like so I, I'm, what I'm, I'm really trying to confused get at as is, to what the point is. Yeah, let me yeah. let me bring it all full uh, circle. Okay. So when we're talking about economic systems that take capitalism out of the equation, that say we no longer have an incentive to exploit people either here or in the third world, um, which is a good point that I've been kind of lapsing on this entire time. All of a sudden the impetus to continue to oppress people on this intersectional basis, whether it's by you know, their gender, their sex, their race, 
all of a sudden seems to evaporate. And this seems to be the case in every non-capitalist economy. Like uh-huh. when we are no longer oppressing people, then all of a sudden these impetuses to keep people separate and divided and to exploit people as much as we possibly can seem to disappear. And the common thread for me is I don't that think that's true, what we're talking though. about. Like China, it, it absolutely it, it, is. No, it definitely isn't. Like that's fact. Like again, that's just factually false. Like, uh, like, 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 China has severe issues with patriarchy. Like, I mean, literally, like, uh, without jumping like way into stuff. I mean, like, mm-hmm. women are not exactly treated amazingly well across all of China, and they're a non-capitalist country. Mm-hmm. So you're wrong. So it sounds Your claim like is just no. Incorrect. It sounds like. So this goes back to the original claim that I that I that I made and to go back to the metaphor it's we have a fire something is on fire yeah, Are we but putting now out you're the just fire? weaseling out of it, though. You, you're claiming I'm that, absolutely like, not weaseling out of it. You're lumping a lot of these things together, and I'm saying that they are distinct. Cuba has that if Cuba. We are... Cuba is is probably the most successful, like, r- like standing, like, communist identified mm-hmm. country in the world. They're mm-hmm. like the most sturdy, in my opinion. And it's only very, very recently that the, they've even begun to to consider LGBT rights. And like, but, I, I fucking, hold on, hold I fucking on. hate the United States in a lot of ways. But like we we got we've had some progress on that too so it's like but the uh, difference between the united states and cuba is the rights of queer people in the united states can be repealed if the right administration and the right congress comes into power so could it be in what cuba, cuba it literally doing. was it was only no, wait wait a minute no Demon no no, no, Mama, no the no, reason hold on hold on hold on hold on no 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 the reason no, the reason why i do not like i'm not getting i'm trying to explain your point I'm trying to say the reason why it's different in Cuba is because with Cuba, it's a constitutional amendment. It's not a law that's being passed. They're literally amending the constitution to include the only reason that happened was because like the i if i'm if i'm remembering this correctly i might be slightly wrong on the details but the only reason that any change happened is because fidel castro's son who took over control of cuba by means of a questionably democratic process uh softened up on lgbt issues and said let's do it that's like dictatorial like uh, uh, like what happens if he didn't do that do you think that would happen so of course i do so queer queer people have a long history in cuba and have been agitating for their conditions for the past 40 years yeah and only when the dictator finally gave a shit about it did anything actually happen that's ridiculous absolutely not this is no this has been in the works this whole time so like (sighs) the one thing that a lot of people in the west don't realize is that when we're talking about these communist systems like uh cuba china for instance their legislative bodies are over 10 times the size of what we have in the United States. Yeah. To give you an example, the amount of representatives in the Soviet Congress was 30,000. Okay. We have like 500 in the United States. It's not even in the same magnitude. So imagine sure. getting 30,000 people to deliberate and agree on something. Okay. It takes time. It, it takes, takes time. time here. It takes time here too. And then there's all kinds of stupid ways that the people in power can get around with that. I don't see any difference between. But that's the point I'm making. It's not a law. It's a constitutional amendment is it? in in Cuba. Yes, it literally is. All right, cool. But I mean, we've had constitutional amendments here. So how does that change? You know, you know what constitutional amendment we've been trying to get passed for the past sixty years? Huh. The Equal Rights Act, which guarantees that women are equal citizens Wait, in the United we, States. Wait, didn't we? Didn't we get like? Isn't like the wait okay so we have like numerous constitutional rulings like i mean for example roe v wade is like uh is like in danger now but only because the uh the court has been like overturned by a massive thing like like by 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 a massive amount of of like influence on the federal courts and that is functionally i mean it's a reading of the constitution that can't be overdone by anybody except for a complete takeover of the of the um of congress not Congress. Uh, Congress can't do anything about it. It's only um, no. It's... Congress can absolutely bring it up for another another view. Yeah, uh, I don't think they can. I thought Roe. Rovi... Yeah. So mm, I don't think so. Um... So, like for instance, if the Supreme Court says this is how we interpret this law, Congress huh? can say, okay, well then we're going to pass a new law, and this is how it is. Yeah, and it has to be done that by a judicial also gets review, interpreted... which has to be means there has to be a lawsuit that works its way up. Like I would argue, no, that, no, no, like... no, that's if no law is passed, but another law can be passed that clarifies that point. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know what this sounds like to me is that like you're very favorable to like 
uh, to like Cuba when they do something like okay, and then you're very unfavorable to us when we do something okay. And like I, I don't. What do you mean? Like, well, because like I mean, like Cuba had a certain way of attaining some level of LGBT rights, and so did we. We both of these things have been yeah. agitated for by working people, by working queer mm -hmm. people for a long time. Right. Um, one right. of them happened to, to, to have it done by dictatorial authority that was, you know, determined down and then it was put into the Constitution. Well, I would, I would disagree with that framing. We had sure. a ruling right. and like, I don't know how, again, I don't know how any of this like builds to your argument that like class reductionism is an interesting frame or even the idea that like, uh, uh, that, that like the removal of capitalism or the removal of like modern current capitalism actually will eradicate other types of discrimination because mm -hmm. uh as far as i know um like the uh success of the revolutions in russia did not like bring about like an immediate cessation of uh aggression on borders uh wars like like did not did russia not uh wage a, a ridiculously bloody conflict in afghanistan over a proxy war with the united states like you're talking about in the 80s yeah that's okay. pretty recently yeah i mean i guess i'm not really sure what your what your point is my point is is that that like that you can't just say that like the argument that like capitalism is the core or capitalism is the cause of all of these things is is false on its so face. So your point is that the United States that that the Soviet Union was oppressing the people of Afghanistan based on their skin color, sex and gender. No, I'm saying that well I mean that's certainly possible, but I mean I'm saying that it doesn't it doesn't immediately solve all of these problems that people find ways and justifications to oppress one another until you acknowledge that there are intersections of prejudice which act in all societies. Right. Right, right. So there's, so that's that's ex that's like exactly that the chemo. That's literally exactly the point of making I didn't this whole like time. The way you is that me out. there is a difference in what is what are antagonists to this belief, right? So like nobody is saying that these are just going to just like magically I mean, disappear. You, you did overnight. say that. You said that once once you get to a system, they just these these reasons for oppression disappear. But I don't agree that no, that's what the I'm case. Saying we have is had many the different impetuses systems. for these oppressions are no longer the case. So what I'm saying is when you're in what, a system, what, for instance, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union outlawed sexism. That's not the case in the United States. The United States has an impetus to make sure these things continue. Yeah, but just there's a vested but, interest wait, wait, wait. in this. Just just okay, first there's a couple of things. First of all, making it like outlawing sexism, I don't believe that that's hundred percent true. And also I'm, you can I'm, read I'm the Constitution. pretty sure that like that sexism is outlawed in the United States as well. It's not. Um is why do you that think? True? Why do you think? Why do you think? Because we don't have the Equal Rights Amendment. But yeah, the equal but that's rights not the amendment, only way that you can that you can make something outlawed. Like we have a of number course, of, of but like the whole reason why people are allowed to do all of this shit in the United States is because it's not institutionalized. Yeah, institutionalized yeah, discrimination that I'm to is, make. is outlawed on the basis of sex on a federal level. Right. So, but that doesn't that doesn't prevent people from coming up with a million reasons. Like, for instance, I have a, I have a friend who was recently fired from their job okay. because they. Yeah, came but that's out. true, and but that's and true has... in Russia too. Like, people find all kinds of reasons to like. Like, do you think that just like sexism disappeared overnight, like in Russia? That's ridiculous. Like, I mean, no. There's... Again, my anyway, point is, like... I literally, Demon Mama, you're literally arguing against a straw man that I what said. What are you talking? No every point. time, every time I give pushback to your to your arguments, you say, you claim that I'm arguing against a straw man. Because What's you're it? making broad generalizations. You just I'm said, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm points. sorry. Listen, Breakfast Detective. You literally, yes. you are not talking. You are like, if you are claiming that you're making some kind of nuance here, you just claimed that the USSR outlawed sexism. That is not a nuanced point. That is a ridiculously okay, broad so statement. So what is what is the what does the Constitution of the USSR say about sexism? I don't fucking know. I can tell you <laughs> at at a very sure. least okay. that they made and it so, so that what? women are seen as absolutely equal in society, and that means. That if women are discriminated against by any means in society, that they can go all the way up to the highest court and okay. have their case heard. You and can do that here in the United States as well, but the process of getting there is totally different. It doesn't mean it gets rid of the thing. Just because you don't have the same legal protections is what I'm talking about. We're going I around think in circles. We do here. here. Like, you the, literally don't. Okay. Why do you think? Okay, Demon Mama. Why do you think that women are still paid less on the dollar in the United States like today? Because there are extra legal. Because they have Wait, legal no, no, protections. No, 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 no. Excuse me. You asked me a question. Because 
in the United States and anywhere else, laws don't actually necessarily immediately impact what actually happens in society. You, a of course, law that wasn't the question. Yes, yes, it fucking was. No, the, the question was, despite the laws, why do you think that's the case? Because there are extra legal ways of discriminating against people that are ideological. Okay, so let's just say if you had a means of recompense, if you had a law that you could point to that says, I can prove that I'm being discriminated against and here's how, do you think that those people would be heard or maybe that would have some change? Some people are objectively heard, yes. There are, like, I can, okay. like, I, there's tons of cases every year that are success, that successfully rule in favor of anti discrimination. Like, it happens all the time. Sure. Now, it's not perfect. So, why, the why, is trash why do you in a lot think? Ways, but, why do you think that business owners in the United States feel empowered enough to discriminate against women despite those laws? I mean, is it because they feel blowback or they they feel threatened by it? I don't know what this question is. Why do people why are you asking why they discriminate? Because I think there's a number of reasons why. We have a culture that's incredibly incredibly anti-woman. That's incredibly chauvinistic the exactly it's not just it's not just chauvinistic like we have a we have a society that's incredibly anti-gay highly religious we have a society that's um extremely traditionalistic we have a society that's very very uh i think i said anti-gay already we have a very very racist society and these things sure. exist independent of capitalism capitalism utilizes them absolutely just like feudalism did as well there you and other go systems. that's the whole no, point i'm trying no, no, to no, make no 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 don't Demon even try the whole part, Wrong. part you are, i'm trying to make if that was the point you were trying to make you did it horribly things, if that was the point you were well, trying to make I'll you did take it horribly. that i'll take that yeah the point that i'm i'm not an expert on this shit i'm trying to be right so the point that i'm trying to make is that all of these things are independent of all the things that we're talking about. That's the whole point of an intersectional all of these, worldview. All of these things but they are, are independent. fueled. Bigotry is independent of an economic system. Humans are bigoted. They are no, fear-based. No, it isn't. Bigotry is fear-based. That's fear -based. an anti-intellectual argument. I mean, that's an anti-intersectional argument. The idea that bigotry and 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 uh, that all these things are are completely independent is not true. They are all they are, they are tied they are together in a lot of ways. Independent. I'm you are, saying that they many have... people are barred from from advancing themselves on on the issue of class because of their race, because of their gender, because of their sexuality. These things influence one another. And yes, while I will agree that in a highly highly super capitalist society like ours, um, that that class can be can do a lot to to lessen other ones. It is by no means, by no means, not even close to being the only axis that's being acted on at, at any point. And therefore, a right. class reductionist right. position is abs is patently absurd and self-defeating. So it seems like we're spinning tires a little bit. I'm not going to reach out to you. You're not going to reach out to me. So let's Wait, let's what do you mean I'm not going to reach out to you? Or, or, or Like, I'm trying to understand. Like, you've made a whole bunch of factually false claims about, throughout this conversation. And all of this was in so service. So, like, I, I, could, I could literally say the same. None of us. So, like, when you say you're making factually false claims, yeah. you're not disproving any of the claims that I make. And vice false versa. Claim. We're having a conversation. So hold on, we're Wait. having a conversation. You're not giving me sources, I'm not giving you sources. So you can say, I think you are wrong, but until you provide like an actual proof of the fact that I'm wrong, we just disagree. Right? Uh, I so, mean, maybe in the same way that I could go in the same way that I could stroll into this conversation and say the earth is flat, and then you could say, no, it isn't. And then I would say, well, you don't have the sources, do you? Like, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. exactly it. If, if, like, if, if I made idea... a claim without sources, then and you, you made, made a, a counter claim without claims sources. In the very beginning. I didn't make you a claim without say sources. You are I... factually wrong. No, what you could that's say is true. I disagree with no, you based on what I know. That's that's you're so splitting let's... hairs here. The idea that you can never that without having a book of sources on hand that you can never have an argument and make points that say, hey, actually I don't think it's true to I don't think that it's a fair or accurate claim to claim that that um like you did in the beginning, which I wrote down and reread back to you. White supremacy and institutionalized right. patriarchy are caused by capitalism, and then I immediately true. gave you op op uh, examples of that not being the case and then you said that's true and, and then I, I said that I re no 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 I rebutted them you so, okay so you you literally are you unironically like not do you unironically believe that institutionalized patriarchy was caused by capitalism at the very least what I'd be willing to say if, if you're looking for a concession here is that what just, I would be willing to say is that 
In, institutionalized patriarchy is caused by capital accumulation and accelerated in, intensely by capitalism. Okay, so that is that is that's, that that's, is taking that's back the, what you. That's you've... the caveat that I would make. No, that's that's not taking back. It is anything. taking back that's, what you said. You claimed I asked you twice. I asked you twice whether white supremacy, institutionalized patriarchy, are caused by capitalism was an accurate point. You can see that point if you want to. But patriarchy, obviously, there are patri. What's it called? A uh, patrio. Uh, Patrio lineage, patrio lineage, or whatever it's called, patrilineal. Um, patrilineage. Yeah, pa patrilineal. Yeah, patrilineal. Patrilineal monarchism right. was like, per, like dominant in Europe, like to the degree where right. you could not become a queen unless there was literally no one, no males to take it for you. It would literally go to your uncle before you. Well. That's yeah. a little bit of a reductive take. That's but not let's reductive at all. It. What the fuck? That's there were, like fact. There were examples of matrilineal succession, but let's move. Yeah, past there it. are random examples, but huge. But it's not random. No, no, wait, yes, there are random examples of societies that were matrilineal. There was like Jewish society and stuff like that. But keep in mind that traditional Ju uh, traditional <laughs> Judaism is still very patriarchal. Dude, and Mama, it's not random. That's the law. They changed the law to allow that. What to I'm saying, no, no, no. Your your assertion that. White supremacy and institutionalized patri patriarchy are caused by capitalism. If you admit that there are systems that had patrilineal uh, law, societal rules that said that men get preference over women that, that are not capitalistic, that disproves your claim that white supremacy and institutional patriarchy are caused by capitalism. So, so first you of all, you're lumping a lot of no, shit together. You're lumping a lot of shit together. So your point in that no, 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 hold on. Why do why your point in that there are there are patriarchal lines of succession? If you remember in the beginning of our conversation, I said that this came out of primitive communism into the development of the agrarian revolution, and then I built on it from like there. But, like like forty thousand years it of human history. It sounds like it sounds like it's much longer than that. But it, it sounds like we're at an impasse here, so... Yeah, because you won't admit that your me, claim was incorrect. Just admit that it was wrong. Your claim, it does, it, the idea that capitalism invented or, 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 or is the cause... To, I'm of, trying to summarize like 10 years of education in an hour-long conversation, and apparently I'm not doing a good job mm, of it. No. So my point is to agree. say that if you're not hearing what I'm saying and I'm not doing... No, maybe no, I'm not wait, doing no, a good no, no, job listen, of representing listen. my case, I'm let's hearing move on what to you're point saying. number two. I'm hearing what you're saying, but what you're saying is false. And you can acknowledge, and you are acknowledging that it's false without actually saying that you're wrong on the point. You're not seeding the point. I mean, you could you could put words in my mouth. No, I wait, 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 wait. I, don't I know just what gave you here. an example of multiple societies that we both agree were patrilineal. The, the, right. the UK the UK monarchic system was patrilineal. That is a historical fact. If okay. that's the case, that system was not capitalistic, and they we're in literally pushing institutionalized patriarchy onto their so, society. Dima, who's the who's the who's the queen of England today? Her name is Elizabeth. So just to kind of like break this a little bit, a couple hundred years ago, it was also Elizabeth. The United Kingdom does not have patrilineal lines of, of succession and hasn't had in almost a thousand years. Right. So that's number one. We're getting way off, off, off topic here. I, I, I can't even believe you just tried to things, make that argument. The one thing that I would say is that in this perfect system, let's say we address all of the different intersectional, you know, uh, issues in the United States: gender, sex, race, di discrimination, etc. Sure. We are exporting all of these things regardless. So until okay. we deal with the system that un that that deals with these things at its core. It's always going to be around. Okay. Well, then, wouldn't it be easier for us to just um, elect? Like, like, wouldn't it just be easier for us to have a king that um, that takes over and then just declares to the rest of the world um, that we're no longer sexist anymore? And and uh, you know, we'll just have a king that does that. Wouldn't that be a good solution? Or would there be problems Un there? Until the next person comes into power and, and decides that yeah, that's no longer the like, case. Almost like there are other considerations um, besides just like having something written in law or having the person say that this thing is wrong in place you have to actually there are like societies yeah in a monarchy in you're, you're arguing for re-education what i don't disagree with that point like huge sections of society are bigoted and have like incredibly chauvinistic anti-intersectional beliefs and view and like viewpoints i agree with that point yeah so, does, what I'm, so do what many I'm other systems is, including Go ahead. I'm am just saying. So in a in a perfect situation, this is this is how I'm trying to reorient this back, right? So in a perfect situation where we deal with all of these things at home, we deal with 
queer and trans liberation. We deal with women's rights. We well, you're arguing we should. You're literature. arguing in favor of class reductionism. Absolutely. So, like, you're seeing these things as mutually ex ex exclusive. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, the idea right. that the idea of uh, uh, the like class reductionism is mutually exclusive with intersectionality. I agree, hundred percent. Exactly, and see that's like, how you view definitionally. No, that's not a view. We, no, 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 no. When no, we no, started no. talking no. about this, when we started talking Wrong. about this, what I said. I'm sorry. You, you should have to be let me have a turn intersectional to in your praxis, and you should be class oriented in your theory. That doesn't that's make any sense. Like that is th that. I, you you say yeah in your praxis you should be intersectional and in your theory you should be class that was literally and the then very we tried to first and, yeah, thing and then I we said. tried to to in, inquire upon that and we found out that your assumptions in your quote unquote theory of being class focused don't actually line up with historical fact or the way that our society functions today and that's so, been like, the, you the are strawmanning me that's intensely. not strawmanning you i understand oh, my that God. you have Wait. like a big chat watching and i get it but what I'm saying is, okay, it sounds right, like right. you're not so we're listening doing gloves to what off I'm now? saying. Do you want to do gloves off now, Breakfast Detective? Because we can do that. If you're going to keep making little stupid, shitty, condescending remarks on the side, I can actually go full activated. We can go. We can make this a bloody one if you want to. But until Demon then, Mama, you're you're literally not listening to no, me. No, no, listen. Excuse the point me. That I'm Breakfast trying to make Detective, and just shut keep the fuck up, please. Your point home. But shut the fuck up, please. You just said, "Oh, I understand. You have a big audience watching all this." Shut Demon the fuck up, Mama. I that, love you, but if you're going to tell me to shut the fuck up, I am going to tell you. I'm absolutely. If you're going to imply that the only reason i'm making an argument is because i'm like trying to pander to my audience when i invited you on here to have a, have a discussion and you and and since then you've been like in this entire conversation you've been incredibly incredibly condescending at multiple points um and now okay. you're starting to do this thing where you're like oh you're trying to play it up for the audience yeah that's a pretty tough implication and i think that i deserve the right you to have been strong I, I deserve the, the right conversation i what was do you not finished to say? i was not finished i believe i deserve the right to tell you to shut the fuck up when you're being incredibly incredibly condescending and implying that i'm only making it only making Making such arguments in front of an audience because of my okay. audience size i have this audience size every single night okay okay i, I have bigger audience size than this i promise you i'm capable congratulations of, yeah yeah so i mean i don't know if you want to make it about that we can talk about that but i i know i've been I very proud points. of your success the entire time i've known you how I, many times have i dm'd you to wait, say i'm wait, so i'm so fucking, fucking happy to what see I'm you succeed is that I, when i'm on here arguing i engage in as good faith okay. as possible and while I, I think that you have not been making your point particularly well, in my opinion, sure. I have attempted to engage in it the entire time. So the implication, the argument that you're saying that I'm trying to play this up for my audience or something is absolutely ridiculous and offensive. Demon Mama, if somebody says to you that you are strawmanning their point, what do you, you have? Wait, you've said two that like 20 possible times. possible solutions to that, right? One of the solutions is to say, no, I'm not. Fuck you, you're wrong. And the other solution is to say, how do you feel like I'm Wait, I've been doing your, that your multiple point. times and every single time you pivot off into talking about something else. But you literally how haven't. Am I, every how time am I, I have said that you strawman me, how you just I... continue to bludgeon your point home and you haven't asked me What are you talking questions. about? I've I mean, been asking you questions thought. this entire time. You rewatch the VOD. I remember what I'm doing. I don't know. Are you like, are you like, like not remembering the entire conversation we've had? I literally just quoted to you the beginning of the conversation that I had when you misrepresented my point. I didn't misrepresent your point. Where did I misrepresent oh. your point? Can you even remember what I said? Oh my God. Okay. Is this does not seem like a productive conversation. I hope you have an excellent night. I have other things to do with my time. Sure. I took time out of my day to talk to you about this. Okay. Um, I hope so you're having I? a great night. Everyone in chat, I hope you're having a great time. I hope this was an interesting, fun conversation. If you hate me, you disagree with me, I love you all the same. Sure. Demon Mama, I love you all the same. Um, I'll talk to you very soon. I hope you have an excellent night. Okay. See ya. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. All right. That was... Uh... Yeah, I didn't think it was going to be bloody. I literally said at the beginning, I didn't think it was going to be blood. That was so ridiculous yeah no definitely there are there is no blood sports in bossing say holy shit